So what comes to people's minds when Advent is mentioned? I think of Advent calendars and chocolates, Advent wreaths and candles, which she has forgot to light in the first <laughs> one. <laughs> then the first year, what else do we think of? Well, it's countdown to Christmas, isn't it? And, and so many other things, but for the Christians, it should be so much more. The, the word Advent comes from Adventus, which means arrival or coming. And it's a time of expectant waiting and preparation for both the celebration of the Nativity, which we've got on the little table, of Christ, but also the return of Christ. Um, and then Jackie later on will help us think about that lovely verse from Titus, when Jesus will return. So, just help hope this time of Advent will help us have a deeper understanding and experience of what God is doing in our lives as we wait for his return. So, every one of these services, we have a quiz, and this time Sheila has actually volunteered, so <laughs> well done <laughs> Sheila, I say. <laughs> Would you like to come and uh, test us out? Oh, I might have volunteered, but don't expect too much, okay? Okay then, so we've got 12 questions, some of them are just for fun, and I think we're fairly evenly matched, so I'll begin with this side, for question number one. Why are Advent candles Ruth. arranged in the shape of a circle? Ruth. 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 symbolises eternity. Oh, so the everlasting was, I, I think that deserves a yeah. point. <laughs> right, this side now. What's the meaning of the Hebrew word Emmanuel? Yes, I have that. <laughs> God with us. Right, name the angel who spoke to John the Baptist's father, Zachariah, and to Jesus' his mother Mary to announce the coming births. Yes, right, wonderful. So that's another, I hope somebody's counting these points, so I'll get lost. <laughs> <laughs> right, and for this side, which Roman ruler ordered the census that required Joseph to take Mary to Bethlehem to register? Which Roman ruler? No. Tiberius. Sorry? Tiberius. No. <laughs> no. Tiberius. Anybody know on this side? <coughs> You're right. It was Caesar Augustus. <laughs> Extra point to that side. So, um, yes, that's your question now, isn't it? When Jesus was born, which of the six Herods is mentioned in the Nativity accounts? <coughs> that is a very hard one. Well done. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think 
about these things, do you? It's strange. Right, for this side, which Old Testament prophet quoted a virgin will conceive? Yes, well done, Ron. <laughs> and for this side, which of the Gospels give us that Old Testament quotation? So which Gospel does that appear in? <coughs> It's Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah, well done. <laughs> um, this side, which Christmas carol has the words, Yet in thy dark street shineth? <laughs> that was a bit easy, wasn't it? <laughs> What's that fair? I don't know. <laughs> right, okay, let's see if this side knows. What is the meaning of the word Noel? No. Joy? No. Gita? <laughs> oh, anybody on this side? Noel? No? Okay. Well, the, the word Noel means birthday. And apparently, in the Middle Ages, especially in France, there was travelling troubadours and they go from town to town singing songs, reciting poetry, but they also took the news of the day with them, so they were like walking newspapers really. <laughs> and um, if they called out Noel, Noel, that was to indicate that there was an important, important birth about to be announced. So that's what Noel means. Okay. Um, and finally, I had to do this one. What were the first Christmas pudding puddings made of? What were the ingredients? One of them had got meat in. Yes, I, th I think that's fair. But does anyone know of anything else? Because they, I found two recipes actually. No, they, well, both of us. Sorry, something. Figgy pudding, something. Figgy. Figgy, well, yeah. yeah. And I, I thought the plums, because people call them plum puddings too, don't they? But then again, you can't get plums here at Christmas, can you? So, well, I suppose you can now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the first one, I think this one must come from, it's a European one. They both originated in the 14th century, but the first one was a kind of a thick porridge. And it was made from whole wheat, boiled in milk, seasoned with cinnamon and coloured with saffron. But the British one, good old British, got beef and mutton in it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was mixed with raisins, currants, wines and spices. But it was a consistency of soup. So completely different to what you think, and they used to call that one frumen tea. So that's from the 14th century. So we don't think we'll have that one this Christmas. <laughs> Did anyone keep count? Yeah, it's even. <laughs> it's Christmas. I think I think you're right. Christmas is coming. Well done, everyone. You get the harder questions on that. I think you did sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I prefer to get my pudding from Lidl's or <laughs> Fancy meat and butter and meat in it. <laughs> so in all our services, we come to, to God in a time of confession. And this is a, just a time of quiet to recollect our own shortcomings and, and our need for God's forgiving grace. <coughs> So if you take up your service sheets on the back, we'll use the confession in the middle. And we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a life spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
and may the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from our sins that we may behold the glory of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing again now. And of course I had to include one Stuart Townend song. So today it's number 1239. 1239. Two, three, nine. From the squalor of a borrowed stable, wonderful words of Jesus' life from his birth, his death, and his glorious ascension. Shall we stand to sing? <laughs>
The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, you speak to our hearts and um, challenge us afresh this Christmas to hear those so familiar words um, with fresh joy and delight in your coming to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, how good are you at waiting? I know Ron and Pam had to wait for a taxi the other day. Um, perhaps we've all waited in bus queues and wondered if, yes, yeah, wondered whether the bus will ever come. Or you're waiting in line at the supermarket checkout and suddenly the, the girl's little light goes on and you know it's going to be a bit of a longer wait than you first envisaged. Um, yeah, waiting on the phone while somebody says, your call is important to us. Um, you are number seven in the queue, right? That's another way of wait. Um, but, you know, eventually we get there, don't we? And we know that the wait is worth it. Um, there are some things, of course, that people wait for in life, um, such as the perfect home, maybe, perfect love, perfect job or situation, and their waiting is a bit of a waste of time. It's not a good wait because probably those things are never going to exist in an absolutely 100% perfect form, and they never will. Israel had a long history of waiting. God's people throughout the Old Testament waiting for the fulfilment of God's promises. And the promises began back in Genesis after Adam and Eve so disastrously disobeyed God. But God promised right there in the beginning that one day one of their descendants would crush Satan's head. And from then on, right through the Old Testament, God spoke to people like Abraham, the prophets, and always there were promises. There will come a, a deliverer, a messiah, a saviour, someone, a, a coming king. We've, we have to wait, but he will come. So unlike people who, or perhaps all of us at times, have waited for something unrealistic, the people of the Old Testament were waiting for something absolutely sure and certain. Keep that in our minds. And so the prophets kept hearing from God and kept encouraging people to believe in God and turn to him. And the very last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, um, ends with Malachi the prophet foretelling that God would send one more prophet to them before the Messiah came, an Elijah figure who would come and challenge them. And this is what Malachi says, if they don't listen to Elijah, then the land will be smitten with a curse. 
So a very serious time was coming. And then what follows after the end of Malachi, and I guess you know this, 400 years of silence. No prophet speaking, nothing, just waiting. We're living on the other side of that long wait, aren't we? Aren't we grateful? I'm really, really grateful the longer I live, um, that I live in New Testament times. So we know that Elijah, the Elijah-like prophet who was to come, was John the Baptist. And he came to, to, onto the scene with a message of repentance, preparing the way for Jesus, the Lamb of God. So the wait the wait was coming to the end. It's like when you hear, you are now number one in the queue. It's near. Elijah, John the Baptist had come. And we know that the long-awaited coming of the Saviour was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit, as we've read here, came to Mary and she conceived and carried in her womb the Son of God. We hear it so often, we hear this story read so often, it's easy to just pass it by, the incredible miracle. And even when that happened, of course, Mary, as some of you will know what that's like, had to wait for nine months before her son was born in Bethlehem. We also know that Anna and Simeon Two godly older people um, spent much of their time worshipping God in the temple and they'd been waiting for the Saviour. And both, before they died, were able to see that promise fulfilled in the baby Jesus. So, what are we waiting for this Advent? Well, we're waiting to celebrate on Christmas Day all those great events of the past. It's better than our own birthdays. It really is. But of course, it's so easy to get caught up in the rush and the frenzy of the secular Christmas all around us. Maybe last year, when we were in lockdown, helped us to sort out our priorities a bit, actually, when we couldn't be rushing around. Let's, in this Advent, as we wait to celebrate the first coming of Christ, Let's take time each day just to sit quietly and reflect on the wonder of the God of the universe becoming a tiny clump of cells in Mary's womb. Absolutely incredible. Well, it would be incredible if we didn't know it was true. The other thing we're waiting for this Advent is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as we need to prepare for our Christmas celebrations, as we wait, we need to prepare for Jesus' returns, Jesus' return. And we're going to be thinking about that verse in Titus in the next thought. We thank you for your word and the wonderful message that it proclaims. Help us to really read prayerfully and inwardly digest what it has to say, especially when we think we know these stories so well. We are so privileged to have the Bible in our own language. So help us to treasure it, to regularly read it and to meditate on it as we wait and by your Holy Spirit understand what it's saying to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. And now Phil is going to give us something extra. Good morning everyone. Um, so I was thinking about uh, what we could have as a something extra and um, what came to me is just um, a little this is a little playlet um, called the long silence and this um, this is I, I know this from um, some of you might have read John Stott's book the cross of Christ and this is quoted at the end of it 
Now this is something which um, I think is appropriate, would be appropriate all year round really, but I, I thought it was just an interesting take on just helping us to think about Christ's incarnation and about his, his life on earth and about all that that meant. Um, so let me just read it to you. This is, um, this is what it says. At the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them. But some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped up her brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. In another group, a Negro lowered his collar. What about this? He demanded, showing an ugly rope burn. Lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes. Why should I suffer? She murmured. It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plain, there were hundreds of such groups. Each had a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he permitted in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear, no hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered most. A Jew, a Negro, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a thalidomide child. In the centre of the plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury, and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. And when the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. No one moved. For suddenly, all knew that God had already served his sentence. And I just thought that's a really uh, thought-provoking <coughs> description, isn't it? Thinking, as we remember uh, the Incarnation, and as we remember Christ coming as judge, as we look forward to that event, we remember that Christ came to endure all the, the evil that this world has to offer. You know, he knows our suffering and he knows our pain. And... Uh, I just thought that this was a really thought-provoking way of thinking about it, that God doesn't stand aloof in heaven where all is sweetness and light, but he came down from heaven, and he came down and uh, he endured, the joy set before him endured the cross. So I, I thought that was some, something worth thinking about, reflecting on uh, at this advent time. Thank you, Phil. And as we think about that, um, Daisy is going to come and lead us in the time of prayer. Let us pray. I will extol my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day 
I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most highly to be praised. His greatness no one can fathom. Not unto us, O Lord, but to you goes all the glory. For your unfailing love and faithfulness Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your wonderful love that desires to bless us with one blessing after another. The greatest blessing you gave us in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a baby to be our Saviour, to give his life on the cross, to die for our sin that we may know forgiveness and in believing, turning our lives over to him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your promise to return to the world, not as a baby, but as a triumphant king. <clears throat> Keep us watchful against temptation to stay close to you Help us to know you more, <coughs> love you more, and to serve you more. Amen. Father God, we thank you for the Bible, because rich and poor, wise and simple, old and young, sad and happy, can find in it the answer to their needs. Help us to understand your word with our minds, and apply it in our lives so that we may grow to be like Jesus. Amen. We thank you for the Christmas season, such an exciting time, especially for children. We pray your blessing today on Great Clacton Junior School as they attend their Christian service at St John's this afternoon. Pour out the Holy Spirit and bless each child the teachers and Mark, our vicar, and Hannah, our youth leader. May the children hear and understand the gospel, we pray. Amen. As people prepare for Christmas, celebrating in their homes and decorating them, and fairy lights that light up uh, windows and doors, pour out your blessing on every home in Clapton, we pray. Many come to church for Christmas, open hearts and ears to hear the wonder of, the, of Christmas, that many may hear of the love that Jesus has for them. Amen. Amen. In silence, let us now bring before the Lord those we know who are sick in body, or burned with worry, or bereaved. May your love surround them, your care protect them, and they may know healing and peace. We pray all these prayers in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we join together and say, pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. reading and thought. Jackie has found a, a new song to sing which fits in so well with our theme of waiting. The song video and words um, are on there I think. So um, we'll try and join in 
but you will know the tune, so it's God rest you merry gentlemen, but with new words, so we'll we'll <coughs> Jesus would 
There would be two cults. Did the Old Testament people realise that? I don't think probably so. Not. Probably not. No, it's it's us that have the privilege to be um, waiting for the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. And there are some days when I feel like I can hardly wait. But we have to learn to wait. Um, but we've got advantages in our waiting that the Old Testament people didn't have. They needed individual prophets and um, people to speak God's word to them. Um, whereas we have the New Testament, don't we? We have the Holy Spirit living in us who makes God's word real to us and speaks to us direct. In a way, I could almost sit down after that reading from Titus because God can speak to us just directly through the words. And Jesus comes to us moment by moment, doesn't he? That's one of the glorious things about knowing Jesus, that he speaks to us daily as we open our hearts to him. And it's good to remind ourselves what a tremendous privilege that is to know Jesus. And we've got direct access into the majesty of God. And we don't need a priest or a prophet to take us there. And in the New Testament, there are stacks of references to the second coming of Jesus. It's amazing. Um, if you read through particularly Paul's letters, but more or less everywhere, actually, well, everywhere, um, there are all these references. And there are people around us, um, perhaps even in the church, I don't know, but certainly out in the community, who will not understand this aspect of Advent that we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Um, there are people like Peter mentions, and um, 2 Peter chapter 3, by the way, is a really good um, chapter to read about the second coming of Jesus. But um, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 says this, Peter says this to us, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So there will be people who just don't understand. But let me assure you again, that great and terrible day of the Lord is definitely coming. <clears throat> and Peter goes on in that same chapter that I just quoted to encourage us, just as Paul does in writing to Titus, that as we wait for that day, we need to prepare. And how do we prepare? By living holy lives. And I think that's really important. It's not just a lying around type of waiting or an even going out and buying presents type of waiting. It's an active waiting, a learning, a growing in holiness. Um, and it's really, really important. Self-controlled, upright, godly, eager to do what is good as we wait. And why is it so important to live holy and godly lives in this waiting period? I think we just need to understand what the Bible says about Jesus' return. And honestly, there are books that are like this thick that have been written about it. So what can I say just in the next two minutes? I'm going to sum it up with six points that I think are important about Jesus' return. And you can go talk to Phil afterwards and he'll probably get yeah. So there are 26 and I've got them all wrong. wrong. Okay, so quickly six points we, we, we understand about Jesus' return from the Bible. One, it will be sudden and unexpected. Could be now. Yeah. Be prepared. Two, it will not be hidden and quiet as was, it, was Jesus' first coming. The whole planet will know when Jesus comes back again. Three, Jesus will come to earth again in clouds of glory and with a great trumpet call bringing with him all those who've been waiting for that day in paradise. And some of us have got people there, haven't we, Daisy? Yes. You know, waiting. We can. And they will be the first to get their new bodies, and we will also get our new resurrection bodies. 
And then, um, if I can find it quickly, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 uh, says this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That was point four. Point five. At that point, the whole creation will be renewed. New heavens, new earth. And we will live on this newly created earth, a very solid earth. We're not going to be floating around in 90s or we with harps or anything. We will live on this new earth with Jesus as King forever and ever. How exciting is that? We are allowed to say hallelujah. <laughs> Even though we're Church of England. And, and, and finally, point number six, there will also be a fearful time of judgment for those who don't know Jesus. And um, I, I think we shouldn't, re in, in our joy, uh, we shouldn't forget that. Um, when we've trusted Jesus, we don't need to fear that day. There is no fear. But, um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we need to remember those who don't yet know Jesus, and that gives us a big motivation for telling them. So we've got an amazing future, and um, I think when we understand that future, we need to learn to live holy lives, because what is true in the future, we're going to be pure and holy and spotless and like Jesus in an unbelievable way. What is true in the future, I think, needs to begin now in the present, doesn't it? Our transformation. So this Advent, as we wait to celebrate first Christ's first coming <coughs> and wait actively by living holy lives for his second coming, let's put our trust in God who came as a baby, but who grew up to live and die for our salvation, suffered that torture that Phil talked about, and who will definitely, definitely, definitely come again one day. Let's be ready. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jackie. Shall we pray as we reflect on those thoughts? Lord Jesus Christ, teach us to anticipate your return by preparing the way for your coming, to catch a glimpse of your kingdom through living by its values today. Live in us now so that the day may come when we live with you and all your people for all eternity, your will complete and your promise fulfilled. And in your name we ask. Amen. Amen. So just a few notices. Um, there's a pile of Advent books at the back. Um, if you want to read the book for Advent, um, it's not long, and, but it's quite good. And they're just a pound. So they're on the table on that side. Um, tomorrow it's together at um, St John's and Sunday it's our Christingle services at St John's, 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock and there are some invites on the table outside if you know anybody who you think would enjoy the Christingle. And our Wednesday worshippers carol service is on the 22nd here. And Mark will be making his annual appearance <laughs> to do that for us. So I don't think there's anything else we need to say. No? No. Yes. Oh, Doreen. Doreen, Doreen thank you. Um, yes, Doreen couldn't be with us today, but she sends her love and she's thinking of us. So she is recovering from a very horrible cold, so she didn't want to spread any germs. So, yes, Doreen sends her love. Sorry, nearly forgot. Oh, we'll send girls back and wish her better. Yeah, we send her back. We send her back. Our love back to her and wish her better. Okay, so our final hymn we're going to sing <coughs> is number 1207. <coughs>
1207, Come see the Lord in his breathtaking splendour. One day our breath will be taken away when we meet Jesus face to face and stare at his majesty. 1207, would you like to stand to sing? <coughs>